Good evening. Welcome to our Monday Thursday service. Tonight, we immerse ourselves in Jesus' last evening before his crucifixion. O come, let us worship. This is the day that Christ, the Lamb of God, gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him. This is the day that Christ gathered with his disciples in the upper room. This is the day that Christ took a towel and washed the disciples' feet, giving us an example that we should do to others as he has done to us. This is the day that Christ our God gave us the holy feast, that we who eat the bread and drink the cup may proclaim his holy sacrifice and be partakers in his resurrection, and at the last day may reign with him in heaven. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. A light no darkness can extinguish. O gracious light, pure brightness of the ever-living Father in heaven, O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed, now as we come to the setting of the sun, and our eyes behold the vesper light, we sing your praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy at all times to be sung by happy voices, O Son of God, O giver of life, and to be glorified through all the worlds. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, the Shepherd of Israel, their pillar of cloud by day, their pillar of fire by night. In these forty days you lead us into the desert of repentance, that in this pilgrimage of prayer we might learn to be your people once more. In fasting and service you bring us back to your heart. Open our eyes to your presence in the world and free our hands to lead others to the radiant splendor of your mercy. Be with us in these journey days, for without you we are lost and will perish. To you alone be dominion and glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, I call to you, come to me quickly. Let my prayer be set forth in your sight as incense. The lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I love the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. Because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. How shall I repay the Lord? For all the good things he has done for me. I will lift the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Eternal God, faithful in your tender compassion, you give us hope for our life here and hereafter through the victory of your only Son. When we share his cup of salvation, revive in us the joy of this everlasting gift. We ask this in his name. Amen. A reading from Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. The word of the Lord. The Lord's Servant, Canticle 5. He was despised, he was rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. As one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, 
and we esteemed him not. Ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the torments he endured. While we thought he was being punished, struck by God and brought low. He was pierced for our sins, bruised for no fault but ours. His punishment has won our peace, and by his wounds we are healed. We had all strayed like sheep, all taking our own way. But the Lord laid on him the guilt of us all. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, Where is my guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city, and found everything as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, Jesus came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And he is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to one another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping the bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The word of the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the words of my lips and the meditation of each heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Tonight we walk with Jesus from sharing the cup of blessing, the establishment of the new covenant, to the Garden of Gethsemane, to a betrayal, to Pilate's headquarters where he faces false accusations and is finally condemned to death. We often focus on the betrayal of Judas this night, or we focus on the agony of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, Tonight we're going to talk about something else, that great and dark motivator, that thing inside of us which drives all the people to their unusual behavior on this night, and that is fear. The chief priests and the Pharisees were afraid of Jesus. They didn't know what he meant. They thought that the people were receiving him as a Messiah, and they didn't trust that he was. They were afraid for the damage a false messiah could do, especially someone with so much influence. And so they plotted to destroy him. They raised false accusations against him. They committed really an act of holy treason, bringing injustice and unrighteousness into the place of godly judgment that they were tasked with overseeing. They should have been the ones that the people could rely on and trust, and instead they whipped the people into a fervor to get them to shout, crucify him. Take Jesus away from us and crucify him. Fear motivated this. The disciples didn't even want to go to Jerusalem. They didn't want to go near the place. Jesus invited them to go to Bethany to see his friend Lazarus, who had just died, and the disciples thought that was too close to Jerusalem and said, should we go there that we may die too? Because they knew that the chief priests were out for them 
hunting them down, seeking them that he, they may destroy Jesus and the disciples. And so they were afraid, yet Jesus courageously went to Bethany and raised his friend from the dead. This must have given the disciples some measure of courage. And they walked into the streets of Jerusalem amid people shouting, Hosanna in the highest, in expectation of a coming Messiah, a Messiah it seems they were blind to see right in front of them. And the disciples were in fear, despite the fact that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. They were still fearful of the chief priests. And it seems to have taken such a toll on them. By the time Jesus had his Passover dinner, his pa- the Seder supper with the disciples, that they were so exhausted that they were going to sleep when Jesus needed them most to pray with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed alone because his friends simply couldn't support him, couldn't be there for him anymore because they were just too exhausted. The load of stress and anxiety and fear had ground them down and they could stay awake no more. Jesus himself was afraid. In the garden, he cried out to God, if there's any other way, take this cup away from me. It's just too much to bear. But Jesus knew, even as he prayed this, that there was no other way. For he had taken the cup at supper that night and said, this is the new covenant. This is my blood. And so Jesus knew that the cup couldn't be taken away, but his human heart cried out to his Father in heaven out of fear. Judas behaved so cowardly. He took money to betray his friend. And then when he had the money, tried to return it to take away the guilt. And when that wouldn't work, he hung himself as a coward. And cowards are motivated by one thing, and that is fear. When Jesus was arrested, the disciples ran away. One of them ran so fast he left his clothes behind because he was sleeping and not wearing them as you would normally wear a robe, but using it as a blanket. Fear. They dispersed into the city where they thought they could not be found. And in the middle of all of this fear, from the highest levels of government to these strange Galilean rejects of Jesus, these disciples, there's just so much anxiety among them. Jesus himself is nearly overcome by it. And yet we see in Jesus something so fascinating in this trip to Jerusalem. When he arrives, he tells his disciples, go into the city, you will find a colt, a donkey, that is tied in front of a house. It has never been ridden. Go tell the owner that the master needs it, and he'll give it to you, and tell him I'll return it. And so the disciples went into the city, and there it was, just as Jesus had said it would be. How strange. Jesus seemed to understand. He seemed to see through the fear, seemed to see through the veil that the rest of us can't see through to know what was going to happen. And then he tells his disciples, go into town and there'll be this guy, just go ask somebody about the upper room and say the master needs it and he will let you have it. To the disciples, seemingly on no information at all, walk into town, probably afraid of how crazy they might look, and they find a guy and they ask if they can use this upper room, which was no doubt really like hard to get because it was Passover and it was busy and the city was full of visitors. And the guy's like, yeah, sure, here's this upper room, you can use it. So it seems that Jesus is able to see with divine vision things that were to happen. Even at supper, he said, one of you is betraying me. One of you whose hand is dipped in this bowl is betraying me tonight. And they all said, oh, it couldn't be me. Jesus says, one of you. So Jesus knew about the donkey that would take him in, in, in victory with the shouts of Hosanna and the palm branches. Jesus knew about the upper room and its location, that someone would let him just use it. And he knew that someone was betraying him. So he had a divine vision for what was to happen because he also knew that he would be crucified. But knowing all of this divine stuff, while it separated him from the Pharisees and the chief priests, and it separated him from the disciples and the mob that would cry crucify, 
While it made him different than them, it wasn't enough to erase his fear. In the garden, he was in anguish. But the difference between Jesus and Judas and Jesus and everybody else was even when he was afraid, he pressed on into God's purpose for him. Jesus understood that God's very best, not just for him, but for the whole world, was on the other side, beyond the horizon of his own fear. And so Jesus pressed on. He clung to the stone. He begged for another way, although he knew there was no other way. And when the police came, he said, I'm the one you're looking for. Who are you looking for? Yeah, it's me. I'm the one you're looking for. Let these other people go. Even in that moment, Jesus aims to protect the ones he loves. He says, take me. He probably could have spun some wonderful story to get out of trouble. Instead, he kept his mouth shut and allowed himself to eventually end up at the cross. Because he knew that God's purposes were greater than the sum of his fears. There is so much fear and anxiety in the world that we live in today. We have our own fears. Fears about our health, our safety, our security, our wealth. Fears about the ones that we love, opportunities that are lost, what may happen tomorrow or even today. And yet, Jesus would have his disciples understand that even when things are at their darkest, like they were in the Garden of Gethsemane that night, when the sun's light had gone out and Jesus wept over just a rock that he clung to, a piece of his own creation that could give him no counsel. Even in the middle of that, Jesus shows leadership. He shows us that if we press on into God's best, if we work towards what God has for us, things will work out. They may be very difficult for us. Jesus was under no illusions that this was going to be difficult and painful and awful, but he understood that on the other side of the awful would come the very best. Tonight, as we contemplate Jesus' incredible ability to walk in a straight line toward what he knew would have to be inevitable if he was to bless us, I would just encourage you to think about what it means for you to follow him? Does it mean following him into difficult spaces? Does it mean letting your friends fail you? Does it mean letting your family fail you? Does it mean letting the system fail you? And yet, in the middle of all of their failure, instead of choosing fear, we choose hope because we can see with the gift of hindsight, what Christ has done for us. We know that this world is fleeting. Its riches will fade. We know that the decisions we've made, good and bad, will eventually pass away. But the one thing that will not pass away is the work that Jesus did by walking through his fear towards God's goodness. Tonight, let us contemplate what it means for us to walk towards God's goodness for us. That sort of self-sacrificing life Jesus encouraged his disciples to follow when they were awake, when he said, you must carry your cross if you want to follow me. He's not encouraging us to live in a death-affirming way, but rather to realize that the cross is a mere moment. Our death will inevitably, invariably come, and it will take the life out of our mortal bodies, but our souls will carry on. And so it doesn't matter what the world throws at us. It doesn't matter how bad it is or how good. On the other side of the grave is hope and it's life. Although we are still waiting for tomorrow, Good Friday, to experience the full weight of the crucifixion, we know that Sunday is coming. Jesus knew that Sunday was coming. In the midst of the greatest, heaviest, thickest darkness, Sunday is coming and that sun will break on the horizon and the tomb will be opened and life will come. Our own resurrection is our future. It is our destiny because Jesus walked through fear and so must we. I've spoken in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. In peace we pray to you, Lord our God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for all those who are alone. For Devon and surrounding communities, our province and our nation. For all our leaders, that they may work for justice, freedom, equality, and peace. For the just and respectful use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are victims of those charged with their protection. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Jane our Bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his Church. We invite your prayers. For all who are suffering in body, mind, and soul. Jesus, vulnerable God, hear and have mercy. For the homeless, the poor, the isolated. Humiliated Savior, misunderstood, falsely condemned, have mercy. For the hopeless, the persecuted, the weak, and the lonely. Christ, abandoned and betrayed by friends and heaven alike, have mercy. For indigenous peoples, especially those with little to no access to health care, safe water, medical supplies, and food, we remember our Treaty 6 neighbors. Wounded healer of the nations, hear and have mercy. For those out of work, or living on restricted incomes or government help that is not equal to their regular income. For the many whose businesses are collapsing. Broken one, weeping alone in Gethsemane, hear and have mercy. For researchers and innovators studying disease, that they may bring relief to the suffering. Miracle in chains, hear and have mercy. For clergy, churches, and Christian communities throughout the world, that we may know how to respond to the wounds of those created in the image of God. Self-sacrificing shepherd, hear and have mercy. We invite your praise for all the life, strength, and health that we have. Lord, we sing your praises while we carry our crosses. For those ministering to the homeless, the isolated, and the poor. Lord, you prepare a table before us, for the end is near. For our families and friends. Our hearts thrill at the love we share as we bear one another's grief. For the treaties that allow us to inhabit this rich land. We sing your name below the stars and shout your name to the winds. For the gifts you invest in us to the joy of your people. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. You give us strength. For all who have recovered and for all we have learned in this pandemic. We rejoice in the breath of life. For the radiant light of Christ, burning away the world's clinging darkness. We delight in your holy presence when sun fails and the moon is gone. For the hope we have in you, now and in the age to come. Lord, your pierced hands will lead us to still waters. Restore our souls. Guide us waking, O Lord. And guard us sleeping, 
that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Amen. Let us pray. O God, Your Son, Jesus Christ, has left to us the meal of bread and wine, in which we share his body and his blood. May we who celebrate this sign of his great love show in our lives the fruits of his redemption. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Our Father Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your Your kingdom kingdom come, come, your your will be done done on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. Thank you for meditating together on the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Have a blessed night. Good Good night. night.